All right, let's, uh, let's continue. Our second panel today is titled Presidential Administration and Bureaucracy. I meant to mention when I introduced the conference as a whole, the title of our conference is taken pretty shamelessly, or we'll say inspired by uh, two of the great seminal works of scholarship in this general area. James Q. Wilson's famous book, Bureaucracy, and Elena Kagan, now Justice Kagan's famous article, Presidential Administration. And of course, Justice Kagan's study of presidential administration is particularly relevant to the discussion we'll have now. I'll briefly introduce our three speakers uh, in the order that they'll present. We're going to begin with Philip Howard, Philip is senior counsel at Covington and Burling and founder of Common Good, which as you'll see in his biography, is described as a nonpartisan national coalition dedicated to restoring common sense in America. How's it working out? Um, <laughs> we have some work to do. Well, you'll see outside, on the, on the table outside, you'll see copies of their current pamphlet, The Campaign for Common Sense. They're on the table uh, outside. And our second presenter will be Paul Verkyle. Paul is a senior fellow and former chairman of the Administrative Conference of the United States, former president of the College of William & Mary, and last but not least, a distinguished senior fellow here at the C. Boyd & Gray Center for the Study of the Administrative State. And our third speaker today will be Ambassador C. Boyd & Gray, former White House counsel, former ambassador, United States uh, ambassador to the European Union, founding partner of Boyd & Gray and Associates, and also a distinguished senior fellow at the Gray Center. Uh, if his name sounds familiar, it's printed on all the coffee mugs outside. Uh, and please take one with you when you go. We'll begin with Philip, who has written a paper for this conference titled, Restoring Accountability to the Executive Branch. Philip. Uh, thank you, Adam. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a real honor to be on the panel with two lions of administrative law, Paul Verkyle and Boyden Gray. Uh, and I'd also like to uh, thank at the beginning my uh, good friend, college classmate, uh, Donald Elliott, who's been uh, an advisor to me uh, on this and um, in fact goaded me into writing um, the paper that I, there are copies of out there on the constitutionality of civil service. Don actually presented for me in the first version of this conference a few months ago because I was unavailable. Um, so none of this would have happened without Don's public shaming of my theories um, <laughs> at a conference several years ago. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, present the brief case why I think there is a way to overhaul civil service uh, which is not political but but constitutional and um, uh, because I only have a few minutes uh, to talk today I, ha I did bring copies of the essay with all the legal citations outside if you want to really poke holes in it. Um, starting at 30,000 feet uh, d democracy only functions as a system of voter accountability if there's a practical connection between the people you elect and how government works. That's the, the, sort of the point. Today those lines are weak, some would say completely attenuated. Uh, we keep electing pr uh, presidents since the 1970s who promised change in Washington and then nothing much happens. Change we can believe in uh, in 2008 and then um, eight years later, uh, eight million Obama voters turned around and voted for Donald Trump, who promised to drain the swamp. So there's this theme in modern history of people promising to overhaul Washington and failing to, uh, to do it. Um, part of the problem, which I, I've written about in a number of books, which I encourage all of you to buy multiple copies of, is, um, is, 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 is a set of, uh, uh, it's regulatory micromanagement. It takes a decade to get a permit to fix infrastructure, that sort of thing. You ask somebody why, why it didn't happen sensibly or some decision isn't made, and the typical answer is, the rule made me do it. And that's a kind of a, a way to avoid responsibility, and, a, and it's also a source of great frustration for Americans. But the part of the problem that, we're going to talk, that I'm going to talk about today is that the president has a uh, little political uh, or practical control over over federal uh, federal employees. Now, um, I don't think there's any question that 
people are for accountability. Joe Biden recently said, democracy runs on accountability. Um, and, and there is a sort of a clear constitutional provision, Article 2, first line, executive power should be vested in a president that talks about where executive power, whatever that means, we can talk about that, uh, means. But there have been um, two misconceptions about accountability that have gotten in the way of, of creating a, a sensible civil service system. And all the tensions that were discussed in the last panel, I think, are valid and require a lot of thought about how you create a, both an accountable and responsible and also professional civil service system. And there are these tensions. But, but one of the tensions is that whenever you talk about uh, reforming civil service, it's generally resisted as an attack on federal employees. And so you get a book by Michael Lewis about how great the people at the Weather Service are or whatever, saying that you know, the, the, uh, federal employees are fantastic. And of course, there are many, most probably predominant number of people who work for federal government are fantastic. The Centers for Disease Control, they're, 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 they're heroes. But they work in a civil service framework that is sluggish and dispiriting. This is not my conclusion. It's the conclusion of two Volcker commissions, the Partnership for Public Service. Anybody who's ever studied it in the last few decades has concluded that this is a terrible dysfunctional system on, 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 on many levels. Volcker Commission found that seven out of the 10 people in a civil service interview didn't bother to report fraud or abuse when they saw it in their colleagues because nothing would happen as, as a result of it. Talks about the erosion of morale over time in the federal service because of this unaccountable sort of dreary framework in which, in, in which they work. So the reason to talk about accountability is not uh, to kind of land where probably Donald Trump would land, which is you're fired, if you go around firing people, it, it, is that, that would actually be quite dispiriting. Uh, the reason is to revive a culture in which public employees go to work believing that everyone else is going to work really hard and do their job too. And there's nothing more dispiriting than working in an organization where you know that your job performance doesn't matter. It's like putting a hole in a balloon. So th it is possible with great, like the Centers for Disease Control is a good example, where to have a cultural professionalism that trumps the fact that there's, everyone knows uh, uh, that, 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 that there's no accountability. But that's the exception, not the rule. So why is there no accountability? There's never, uh, we've had some of the history of it before in the Leonard White book on the Federalist goes through this sort of idea that, that was talked about in the last panel that it was kind of a, kind of a permanent job you know, for, for, for families and such. And there is this element today that the same thing happens, that people who know how to play the game get their kids you know, in, in, into civil service. Um, but. But immediately what happened, and I talk about the history more post the Pendleton Act in, in my paper, is that in the 1960s, as we know, we had a kind of a due process revolution. We had the, the JFK uh, executive order that authorized collective bargaining. We had a Supreme Court opinions that said public jobs were a property right and such. We had this wave of, of uh, uh, individual rights um, type um, uh, decisions, and that ended with, in the civil service case, with a concrete statute, the Civil Service Reform Act of 1978, which uh, codified protections for federal employees. Uh, there are detailed provisions on approval. You have to have uh, performance improvement plans. You must prove um, the lack of performance, give people a chance to improve. There are four levels of review and appeal if you want to get rid of a, a uh, um, uh, terminate a federal employee. Uh, I go through these in the paper. And it legislated collective bargaining, um, which, among other things, imposes a requirement that if you want to put a negative 
uh, comment in the file of a federal employee, for example, that you have to have advance notice to the employee, meetings with the employee and the union representative and such. And the effect of that is the last time there was a, uh, a report, and over 99% of federal employees got a fully successful rating which, by the way, makes it impossible to terminate them under these other procedures, because why would you terminate somebody who's been fully successful? The second misconception of, of civil service is that um, it's a system of tenure. Uh, the Pendleton Act, as we learned last year, was not it's just a hiring, it was about neutral hiring, getting rid of spoils by not appointing them politically. And this was not just a political decision, it was also a constitutional decision. There was an attorney general's opinion at the time that said it would manifestly unconstitutional to uh, restrict the president, both in who he appointed, so that's why they came up with the rule of three, you could pick among three top test takers, as well as who you can, um, who you can fire. Um, this idea of presidential authority over federal employees was not a mid-19th century aberration. Madison said, when, in the decision of 1789, the president should alone possess the power of removal from office to create an unbroken chain of dependence. The lowest officer, the middle grade, the highest will depend as they ought on the president. He goes on, requiring the president to work with subordinate executive officers who rendered inefficient service or la had lack of loyalty would, would thwart the president and his great responsibility. If you go through history, and I've read every single Supreme Court case, because I was goaded by Don Elliott to do it, on, on the authority of the president over, over employees, it's, they all affirm what became known as the exclusive and illimitable power of the chief executive to dismiss federal employees. It comes up in the context of terminating people before the end of their fixed terms. The president had the power to do that. The only exceptions were first in the Lloyd LaFollette Act of 1912, um, Congress imposed, and almost certainly constitutional, a protection against politically motivated firings so that if someone thought they were fired for the wrong reason, they could make a complaint, submit a written document to then the Civil Service Commission, which would look at it and make a decision. There was no adversarial hearing, no right to, no right to counsel. That was very explicit in the statute. No hearings, no counsel, et cetera. Um, and the second were the decisions, starting with Humphrey's executor, that said when you have quasi-judicial or other independent type officers, you act, you cannot, the president cannot dismiss them except for cause. That's where you get into the court. Morrison v. Olson, the special prosecutor and such. These, uh, these opinions have been explicitly reaffirmed in the last few years by the Supreme Court, quoting Myers on the exclusive and illimitable power to, 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 to remove uh, officers. So my conclusion in the paper is that the provisions of the Civil Service Reform Act 1978 that require hearings and all this sort of process and performance improvement plans and stuff, which has the practical, undeniable effect of preve preventing uh, any termination of employees, and the imposition of collective bargaining are unconstitutional. In my view, without room for serious debate, they're unconstitutional under this wave of 170 years of jurisprudence decisions, including recent decisions by the Supreme Court. Um, so the bottom line here, though, is not to throw a rock at the system and say you can do whatever you want. I think there still is room for professional civil service. Uh, but the path here, I think, is to begin to redesign it and combine that with the constitutional challenge. Uh, Professor Paul Light and I are working on a redesign. He used to work, for, work with Paul Volcker on this of the civil service system, creating a system that was that would still have neutral hiring, but not as clunky as it is today, and would allow practical accountability with protections out as in the Lloyd La Follette Act against uh, you know firing people because they don't because they believe in climate change, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, you but you would create a, a civil service where, where 
everyone knows that they have to do their job, they have to perform to the satisfaction of the people they work for, and I think bring, I think, honor and energy uh, back to a system that, that, that everyone knows is broken. Well, Philip, you said you brought uh, some hard copies of your paper. It's also available online on our website. Uh, and so is the second paper we'll be discussing on this panel. Uh, Presidential Administration, the Appointment of ALJs, and the Future of Four-Cause Removal Protection. Paul Verkyle. Thank you very much. Um, is, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, Philip, I can't spend all my time discussing exactly what he's saying, but I will end up with some talk feeling about it. I want to start off with your observation that um, Donald Trump can't simply say you're fired to the civil service. I think that has to be right. Uh, but I want to give you some more pause. Um, that might be bad, but there's a worse situation. Um, Xi Jinping in China, who has to deal with the coronavirus, said on the quoted in the Times, he's going to punish bureaucrats who, quote, lack boldness. <laughs> so which regime would you rather be under? Um, and of course, maybe we don't want boldness in the first place. Um, my, my paper is about a case, and we are lawyers. Uh, the first panel was all political scientists, and you didn't hear one case name. And now you're going to get tired of hearing case names. I'm sorry. The Lucia case, uh, Lucia versus SEC. This is a case involving administrative law judges. I, in my paper, I discuss it in detail. I'll try and make it very t uh, concise here. The question is, are ALJs um, employees or inferior officers? And the court decides they're inferior officers and that, therefore, they must be appointed by the uh, SEC, where they worked, by the commission, not by the staff. Now, the irony of the case is it was really mooted because um, they had already, the SEC had already done that to, rec to make sure that the ALJs were functioning adequately. But still, the case becomes now a vehicle for really examining the whole question that Philip has raised about tenure in office. Um, ALJs, after the case, and Justice Breyer has a concurring and dissenting opinion which poses the issue. We, uh, I was a member of a group of law professors who said, we didn't take a position on the merits in the case, we just wanted you to remember the Administrative Procedure Act, which does protect ALJs from removal. And we wanted, therefore, we requested that the court address the removal issue, which was what Justice Breyer picked up on in his concurring and dissenting opinion. The removal issue, however, was left aside in the case. The SG had asked that removal be addressed too, but his view was that it ought to be facilitated through the case, uh, through an action of the court. Um, now, in the wake of the case, so two things happened. <coughs> One is the uh, president issued an executive order um, dramatically expanding the power of agencies to appoint um, administrative law judges. The um, OPM has been administering ALJ appointments for a very long time. The power was taken from o uh, OPM and given to administrative, uh, given to the agency head to directly. Um, that's a very big move. And frankly, I, I have to say I applaud the administration for doing that. Um, as, when I was at ACUS, administrative conference, we were asked by President Obama to see if we could help get OPM to expedite its procedures so they could appoint uh, administrative law judges for the Social Security Disability Program because of people, there was a two million person queue and there weren't enough judges to decide the cases and people were dying while they were waiting to get a, a result. Well, I say we spent all this time with OPM. We could not budge them. They have a very elaborate hiring process, the rule of three, et cetera. And um, so I found it extremely frustrating. 
with the White House behind it, we couldn't get OPM to move because there was this little cabal of group which including the, that did this decision making and they weren't going to budge. So that is bureaucracy in action, a very source of frustration. So moving it to the agencies makes a lot of sense. My sense, for example, with disability, they wanted just to appoint enough ALJs, but they wanted ALJs who had particular capacity in mass justice decision making. It's not like the SEC when you decide thousands of cases a year, hundreds of cases in your case per individual judge. So that goes forward, I think, is probably a plus. Now there is a danger with it, and, and a lot of folks, including Sally Katzen, by the way, Boyden, <coughs> who says this is terrible because you've given the agencies the power now and they can um, go over, ignore independence and pick people who don't really qualify. Um, so I'm not really too worried about that. I, I have to concede the danger of it you know, when you give an agency superpowers like that. But um, it seems to me, if I'm an agency head, I want, I want to appoint an ALJ who can decide cases smartly and properly so I don't have to worry about being remanded or I don't have to worry about them not carrying their workload. So it seems to me I, the danger may be a little bit there about you know, overreaching, but not a real one. And by the way, the other thing it does, under, under the rule of three, OPM had a score system where the veteran's preference always prevailed. That you got five points, or if you're disabled, 10 points added to your score. And since all the scores were like 80 to 85, a 10 point or a five would decide every case. And now the veteran's preference under this new executive order is only as can take it into consideration, which I think is a proper relationship. You should consider it, but it shouldn't be conclusive, which it was under the OPM rules. So that again, I think is a positive. All right, that's where they are. Now the Solicitor General, and this was coordinated with the White House, it must have been, it came out the same day. He issued a memo to all lawyers and agencies that um, he's going to expand the notion of this case, the Lucia case, which um, he referred to to include all administrative judges. Now, as you well know, there may be, there may be 2,000 ALJs across government, most of them at your social security disability, about 90%. Um, but there may be 10, we don't even know the number of other judges who aren't ALJs and not protected by tenure in the same way. Um, but it's an interesting proposition expanding a coverage because maybe it could work either way. I, I, I worry that we'll cut back ALJ protections under the APA. On the other hand, if you took the other view, maybe we'd expand tenure protections under this other group. For example, the big group is immigration judges who work in, which, inside the Department uh, of Justice uh, and have very few protections against removal and have a lot of demands pushed terms of caseload demands that the ALJs through their uh, lobby and, and through their unions can sometimes uh, object to. So that's a big tension there. Um, the, basically, this therefore serves up a very big question for the Supreme Court and for, for administration, which is, let's see, is tenure coming or going? I think the cases you mentioned, Philip, Humphrey's executor, e even Myers. Myers just said the, the Senate couldn't participate in removal. And, and Myers didn't say removal uh, had to be without any for cause requirement by the president. But Humphreys holds up that Wiener versus the United States unanimous case holds up um, in, in, in tenure for judges who can't be removed. The problem is, as we, we talked in earlier, it's only for adjudicative administrative, administrative adjudicators. And so my final question really is, what about policy makers? Will they, ha if your view were to prevail, let's say the Supreme Court held the Civil Service Reform Act unconstitutional, um, which I don't think will happen, but we put it on the table for, for debate. Um, 
What happens to policymakers who aren't adjudicators? Do they still have tenure? The ones I, I think I could defend most readily, and not all of them, maybe, but most readily, I, I would take um, the, uh, anyone dealing with financial um, management, financial services, there's early evidence that the control of the currency was given protections even though the Secretary of the Treasury is not from, from removal. So, and, uh, and of course this would cover the Federal Reserve Board and I think they should be accepted out for tenure, protections, as policy makers. They aren't adjudicators. Um, the other category is the Foreign Service. The Foreign Service, and, and for my money, the best reason you want to protect the Foreign Service is the ambassadors who testified in the impeachment hearing. If you look at Yovanovitch and, and Taylor, and, and they were violating uh, dictates of the White House to go testify, they were taking a big chance. Um, but if, if they don't represent what we want civil servants to be, I, I don't know who does. And, and they came forward and they, they expressed their views <coughs> because they care about America. So my question is, accountability is important, which I share, but is accountability to whom? It isn't accountability only to the president, it's to the United States of America. Uh, you take your oath to uphold the Constitution, and that's an important thing. I think oath taking is an important thing. Um, it's to the United States of America, and they reflect it. So I would like to say that we need to preserve tenure protections for non-adjudicative as well as adjudicative officers. I worry the court is going down the line that may just be preserving it. I don't think that it will reverse Humphreys, actually, even though Humphreys has been knocked around for a long time. Um, but I do worry about policy makers who do. When you think of foreign policy, it isn't like saying, well, let's go into a deregulatory mode. It's saying, it's, we got these connections that uh, no president can even know about, uh, allies and adversaries and over the years. And so you want the expertise in government and you've got to protect it. Um, therefore, at will public employment, which there is a bill um, now to make public employment at will, which I guess would satisfy, uh, and I'm not sure you're requesting it, I'm right. not putting it on you, but at will public employment I think would, would be a disaster, and um, frankly I, I don't think it, I'd like to say it wouldn't be constitutional for more than adjudicative officers. Since Paul, since you didn't plug your book, I'll, I'll plug your book. Oh, uh, you. you explore some of these themes uh, in his recent book titled Valuing Bureaucracy. May I just add, as you think kind to do that. You're cutting me off as I, during my promo for your book. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry. Keep going, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> um, but I want one quote from that book I, I just can't resist. I, I interviewed George Shultz in the book uh, because I was, you know, the Reagan years where the where the years were contractors, and I'm very concerned about the growth of contractors versus civil servants, which didn't come up in this today's discussion. But anyway, I asked Judge Schultz, did he like civil servants or did he prefer contractors? And he said, you know, when I was head of OMB, I loved working with the civil servants. They just have to be A players. And I thought that's a pretty good way to describe the civil service you would like and right, I would right. like. Um, so, it, so it's in there. Thank you. Right. Well, Paul touched on uh, civil servants both in domestic policy and in diplomacy. Uh, our third speaker has unique experience in both those fields. So, Boyden, your thoughts? <coughs> well, on diplomacy, um, I was always confused by the uh, impeachment stuff because as an ambassador, I was expected to resign as soon as my uh, my uh, <coughs> administration uh, lost an election. I mean, it was automatic. And I could have perhaps generated a coterie, a <coughs> group of people to uh, exclaim uh, upon my sterling uh, abilities and um, claim that I had a right to the job that I had been appointed. But uh, I think the rule is I mean, ambassadors serve at the pleasure of the president. and. Is that in the statute anywhere? I don't, I don't know that it is, but that certainly is the norm, and uh, that's what normally happens. So this fight over the ambassador to the Ukraine, 
<coughs> only struck me as being slightly bizarre because uh, she should have been out of there the minute uh, Trump got elected. But anyway, that's uh, I don't. That's not. But my, she was. My, I mean, she was removed. Well, she was removed only. Uh, you know, after the removal has consumed tens tens of thousands of hours of work uh, uh, on impeachment to show that somehow there's something nefarious about her removal. Um, who was protecting me when I was there? You know, after all, you forgot in your introduction well, that that I was not only ambassador to the EU, I was also special envoy to the European Union for Eurasian Energy Affairs. And I want to tell you, uh, being a special envoy is very special in Brussels. Well, <laughs> well I wish you... And the reason is, is I would there take are no other special anytime. envoys. What? I would take your case any time well, if I'm, you were abused. Gosh, well, I should have called you. Um, <laughs> on my last night in Brussels, I was leaving and packing up, but um, I was invited to a dinner uh, uh, by the, uh, 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 you know, commanding officer, commanding general of the European Defense Force. It was a little bizarre because there's no such thing as a European Defense Force. But never mind. He had a, he had a house and he had a chef and uh, he had the right to invite people and I, he sent me a guest list to try to entice me to come, but I really couldn't go because I was packing. And um, because of the, of the tradition that you leave once. And um, the um, guest list identified me as Seaboy and Gray U.S. Special Convoy, <laughs> which, I, which I thought was appropriate since I was preparing my convoy yes, right. to, uh, uh, to leave. Um, I think the material in both of your uh, presentations is extremely valuable, valuable and ought to be absorbed. Um, this question of, of, of responsibility, responsiveness to uh, accountability to the political branches is it, very much in play. It's, 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 it's really what, 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 what leads one to worry about the administrative state and the swamp and all of that. And um, the only thing I would, I would add to this is it's, it's necessary to do these responsive things. You know, Phil, your point that the president has practical authority over only 2% of the federal workforce is really quite startling. I mean, I've known that for years, obviously. There are only about six political appointees at EPA, for example, um, uh, that can control this agency of I don't know how many thousands of people. Um, uh, but that's not right. Having said all of that, I think that um, the, 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 these papers miss or don't deal with a problem that I don't know how you solve it by looking at civil service reform or ALJs, which is the problem of agency capture. We were talking about this a little bit before the paddle started. And that's a well-known concept. It's, it's, um, it is true. It's real. And I just came from um, a UN panel on um, some EPA matters, and I was on a panel with Tim Worth, uh, with whom I still have a very close friendship, uh, notwithstanding the fact that he's in, in the other party. And we worked together on the Clean Air Act. When, in, in the old days, when Congress actually did things and actually set the rules, and the bureaucracy didn't matter that much because, because it was Congress that was setting the rules. Uh, and responsiveness to a president who's trying to get his program through was just not as much of an issue when Congress was doing its job. But I do remember um, years later when he's out of office and Tom Daschle's out of office, and we go in to talk to Gina McCarthy, this is at the end of uh, Obama, and about EPA's disregard for uh, some uh, very clear provisions in the Clean Air Act Amendments of 1990, and I have never seen to, this is a former majority leader, a former chairman of the Senate Energy Committee, treated with such incredibly uh, 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 dis, uh, bad disrespect by an appointee uh, in, in uh, unelected appointee in, a, in an agency. She just ripped their heads off. It was the most, it was the most disrespectful display I have ever seen. And if, if I'd been a, a Democrat, I might have reported it to Obama in the hopes that he would fire uh, uh, the administrator of EPA, who shall go unnamed, um, 
but it, but it was just astonishing. And that's where we are today with Congress having abdicated its function. Uh, it's opened the doors even more to agency capture. And I think um, without addressing capture and without addressing the, the, the abdication of Congress over the details of what these agencies are supposed to do, we're not getting the whole picture. If you, you can't fix that if you don't also fix what you're talking about. Yeah. What I'm saying is, and the only point I'm trying to make, and then I'll shut up, is you have to deal with both. You have to deal with both. And um, if you don't, uh, one, fixing one or the other is not going to work. I have only one question in the time remaining to me. <coughs> um, there, there's discussion, I think, in both papers about who, who are the people covered by the kind of protections that ALJs, and there's discussion about deciders, I think in both papers. And, and then the, the reference to a um, law review article by Mascot right. about, you know, you might call them policymakers, I don't know. But I do know that the trouble at the agencies that I always had trouble with when I was doing the Reg stuff in the Reagan years and since then for clients, um, the, the problem are these bureaucrats who just dig in and you can't do anything with them um, uh, unless, you, unless you have an army of, of, of people behind you. And you look at um, what's happened to the White House's ability to try to exercise control and you see the main entity that does this just for the regulatory agencies, and, and, you, and you can't touch, of course, the independent agencies, so all the financial stuff, uh, mm -hmm. OCC, FDIC, Federal Reserve, you know, whatever, is off limits, uh, which is sort of bizarre, uh, since it's a pretty important part of our economy, um, and the FCC as well. You add all those up, and that's, that's, that's it. That's the ballgame, except for EPA, which maintains its presence uh, very loudly. Um, so the, 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 you know, for me, the question is, how do you, how do you deal with uh, recalcitrant uh, bureaucrats? And the agency that does this, or the element in the White House, is OIRA. Everyone knows here what OIRA is. The public never heard of it. Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. I think its budget today is lower than it was when this whole thing started in 1981 under the Paperwork Reduction Act. And it, it just doesn't have enough people to do what we were able to do. And we were able to enlist, and did, um, economists and whatnot at the FTC and at the Department of Justice. Today, they won't do this. They both have programs in the CFR. They're supposed to intervene or participate in agency proceedings to make sure that there's not capture and there's the least uh, oppressive uh, rule comes out, the most free market possible under the, under the, under the regs and whatnot. Um, but um, that doesn't happen anymore. There just aren't enough people in the executive office of the president, writ large, which includes OMB. Uh, there just aren't enough people there to go head to head with with the, the, the huge with the huge um, uh, body of uh, so-called deciders in the uh, in the federal agencies and. This N on one note, you know, when the whale was discovered, if anyone remembers the whale, this was a, 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 someone who was fooling around at J.P. Morgan um, and cost, cost J.P. Morgan five uh, billion dollars or something, which was just pocket change for them, so it passed rather, rather without too much notice. Um, when that huge problem occurred, there were 300 uh, uh, Federal Reserve Board officials embedded in J.P. Morgan to make sure this didn't happen. 300. <laughs> so much for, yeah. so much for excellence. Right. Um, do you think it would have been any different if there had been 3,000 yeah. or 30,000? I don't think it would have made any difference. 
So let's get rid of all the agencies. No, no, I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I have a couple of questions, but I'm sure Philip and Paul both have uh, some thoughts and response. Philip, do you have anything? Uh, Yeah. um, I think there are two questions that we've raised on this panel. One is, is is it possible even to talk about what a new system should look like? Is that just a, a fool's errand, or is there a practical way of of actually creating a, a, a new and better civil service system. And I'm not talking about declaring the entire Civil Service Reform Act 1978 unconstitutional. I'm talking about making it, declaring unconstitutional the provisions that make it impossible as a practical matter for not just the president, but any manager to manage the personnel in his office. They can't terminate the bad employees. They can't, it's, it's, it's impossible. I don't think you can do that consistent. Uh, I'm going to quote uh, something from Free Enterprise Fund, uh, decision of you know a decade and a half ago, about the president's, the executive's power to remove officers at will and without cause. There is a line of constitutional reasoning that allows us to dislodge this system. The second question is then. What should it look like? You don't want to, you know, kind of fire at will to think. Uh, I spent a certain amount of time talking to Foreign Service officers about Foreign Service. Their biggest complaint is the inability to manage the people who work for them. I mean, ironically. So, so there's a manager level who are trying to get the job done in foreign embassies around the country and around the world and such. And, and, and then there are the, the people who work for them. And they're just as frustrated as the people in the White House, you know, on their, own, on their own level. And I'm not suggesting that the ideal solution, if there is one, is easy. And I do agree with the last panel. It always involves a tension. Yeah. You know, it all, but, it, but it also, that tension has to involve exposure. And even in independent agencies, you can get rid of people under Humphrey's for cause. Mm-hmm. You know, and so everyone needs to feel at risk, at least at some level, of doing their job and holding their share. And I think it's just a fantastic opportunity to, oh, and the other thing is, if we were able to create a new system, dislodge the current one, create it, that opens the door to a dramatic simplification of the regulatory state. Because if you can get rid of people who were actually acting in bad faith, like maybe the people Boyden met with, with Dashiell, et cetera, then all of a sudden, you don't have to have 1,000-page rule books telling them exactly how to do their job. You can give them a little more leeway, honor them with the real, the authority that goes with their responsibility, and actually let the government work more like it did when the Civil Service, I mean, when the Interstate Highway Act, 1956, 29 pages long, 10 year, 29 pages, there's basically no such thing as regulations then. 10 years later, they built 21,000 miles of road. Today, the last transportation bill is 500 pages, but implemented by 10,000 pages of regs. It takes 10 years just to get a permit. So, you know, so there's, the, the government ought to, you know, we don't want to turn back the clock completely. It's a new world and stuff, but it has to be able to act. And you can't act unless the people can be who act are accountable. So there's this puzzle that we're all t- struggling with that I think is really important to kind of unravel. And um, so I think there's an opportunity, an exciting opportunity here. Paul, yeah, I, I want to sh- I want to share that view. Um, I do think there's an a, a opportunity, and I do think civil service needs reform. Um, just to say some, a few of the things that have happened and are happening, what the uh, National Academy of Public Administration has a major uh, initiative on high, the hiring process, getting the right people into the positions. One of the problems is that you cannot hire, so forget you can't fire, that's Good. at the other end of the t- But how do you get the A players that George Shultz wanted in government? So that's a big aspect of it, and it should be reformed and make it easier. Um, you, you can't deal with USA jobs if you've ever tried. Um, the other thing is, I think you should not, we should not think about government as a career proposition. You want people to come in government 
and maybe for a year or two, and then be able to come back if they want and go out. It, this, this really, this flux would add new ideas and new, so that's another initiative. Um, and finally, I do think that when we get um, things like the Veterans Affairs <coughs> Accountability Act to deal with a specific problem created by the waitlist scandal, you will. That's Congress acting, that's 2017, that's in the Trump years, um, to, to solve a particular problem. That statute ought to be, at least in concept, generally applied to government. Uh, so I, I can accept all of that, uh, at least from my p p position. I just don't want to go so far that we, I don't want to lose whistleblower protection, <coughs> which could be a danger, okay, and things like that. Um, so I have an observation uh, and then two questions. Uh, first, the observation, Philip, at the beginning of your remarks, you, you framed your point in terms of, you said, political and practical control of the bureaucracy. Right. And so somewhat distinct from legal control. These are separate questions, not right. just what's the law, right. but, but these other sort of informal levers. And it just resonated with me because there's an interesting book out right now on management in the private sector. It's by Ben Horowitz, co-founder of the Andreessen Horowitz venture capital firm. And the book, it's very zen, it's called uh, What You Do Is Who You Are. I still don't know quite what that means. But the point of the book is, is in Silicon Valley, in the most innovative parts of our economy, the most fast changing parts, it's such a challenge. And Horowitz is writing about the challenge of instilling or changing a culture. Right. And that's the point of his book is that it's culture. And so as I listen to this conversation, it's just an observation, I wonder is it even possible for temporary political leadership to actually define or change the culture and maybe that's the most important thing maybe it's impossible maybe the bureaucracy will inevitably set its own mission and define its own culture in ways that law polit top politics and other sort of norms that are brought attempted from the top down just can't bring so I'm just going to throw that out there but I, I have two questions the first one it actually touches on a point that Paul raised at the end about attracting the right people does the federal government just need to, I mean, not just pay more, but is the first step, could it be trying to attract a different sort of, uh, attract people from different parts of the economy by trying to pay more competitively with the private sector, making hiring and training more flexible, and then Paul, as you indicated, allowing easier exit and re-entry so that the government doesn't remain sort of a standalone, you know, once and for all career track, but the kind of thing that is more nimble and, and more reflective of the, 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 the sorts of standards that we have in, in the private sector. So Paul, pose that to you first, but anybody else? No, I, I, I agree. I, I think we ought to worry about that. I think the culture issue ra you raised is a very interesting one. Um, and. There are agencies where the culture is very strong. You, you mentioned um, some, and we're in the middle of the coronavirus here, so just think about the CDC uh, as an example, I think, where there's a good culture. That culture can spread, and leadership within an agency can change the culture. Um, and it does require a certain uh, term. You can't do it overnight, but if you could hire better, and you could stay in job, which requires continuity beyond a political term necessarily. Um, you can change the culture. Uh, the prices do go up. I like the idea of raising because if you give rid of tenure, I mean, one of the you know you trade off. Look, I was a university president. You turn you trade off things. Tenure in academic life is crucial, and it's actually you can pay less because you can grant tenure, right? But so just remember that the consequences <laughs> are. Or serious. Yeah. Um, culture, the, the most important inducement to getting good people, um, studies show, is not money but responsibility. You know, give people a reason, to, a way to make a difference, and they'll work for, if they can afford it, a third the price. I mean, it's really not. Uh, it's, it, and. Uh, Tester Barnard, great management theorist, talked about this, and he went through a list of all the inducements that make people come to work for some. And another one is is the is actually the culture itself. 
So responsibility is probably number one. The next one is a culture <laughs> of, of, of a feeling of togetherness, and we're all in it together, we're working hard. There too, accountability is important because you want everybody to be working to, you know, to be working hard. CDC, those people have real responsibility because you can't legislate how to fix right. a virus. Right. You know, there are no rules that telling you how to do it. They have to figure it out. You know, and it's the, the stories from CDC are unbelievable. They, the, the head of CDC asked for volunteers to go to the Ebola crisis and whenever it was, you know, 10 years ago, you know, where people who showed up died 2,000 people volunteered. 2,000. I mean, it's just extraordinary. It's extraordinary culture. They happen to be in Atlanta, by the way, sort of, a, a, sort of an advertisement for getting out of Washington. <laughs> but, the, um, uh, but, but, but going to Boyden's point about capture, capture really is important. And I do think that the only way you get rid of capture is accountability. You have to be able, people have to feel at risk if they're not going to be responsive to <laughs> Sensible ideas from Tim Worth and Tom Nashel, yeah. you know, you know, then you know, at, at EPA, those people ought to be at risk of losing, you know, their positions. I mean, it's just, it's, and they are not at risk. I mean, they, they, they truly feel, you know, like they have a cocoon around them. So, uh, you know, it, again, how you set up that system is a little subtle. You don't want people going around saying you're fired. But on the other hand. The, the, if you don't have the risk, you don't get the uh, responsiveness. Uh, on a panel full of lawyers, I should ask at least one legal question. Um, <laughs> maybe. We, maybe. We've talked a little bit about the four cause <laughs> removal standard. Um, in fact, students in the room uh, who are in my administrative law class, that's the topic for Monday, is Myers and Humber's executor and all the rest. It's always been interesting, though, to, to look at those cases, and the court has never definitively said that the four cause removal standard or the standard of malfeasance, inefficiency, right. neglect of duty, that it actually prohibits the president from removing people over policy disagreements. Roberts um, and, and the court suggested it in the Sarbanes-Oxley case. Justice Kavanaugh has embraced that view in one of his DC Circuit views. But you go back into the 80s in the, the Comptroller General case, Voucher versus Sinar, and the court said policy disagreement might be enough. Right. And so my question is, if this four cause removal standard if it's so significant and it needs reform, does it need to be all or nothing? Does the standard need to be struck down by the court? Or if the court were to reinterpret that standard as allowing more flexibility for policy-based disagreement, would that solve the problem that you've identified? And let me start with Boyden, since he didn't get a chance to weigh in on the last one, right. if, if Boyden has any thoughts on this. So, so you're saying the question is, do you have to go? What do you mean by go all the way? I'm saying if the court stops short, <laughs> say the court ever has an opportunity to, to look head on at the constitutionality of for-cause removal protection. If there isn't, say there isn't a majority there that wants to strike down the statute altogether, could the court at least solve some of the problems that you've identified in the past and that Phillips talked about by just reinterpreting those statutes as allowing the president to fire, remove people over policy disagreements? Well, I would like to think that a president could, but most presidents haven't really tested it. Yeah. And I wish, I, wish some, I wish some tests would take place. We're, we're involved in a case now, I won't go into great detail about it, because I really probably shouldn't uh, even raise it at all, but uh, there is an agency embedded in Treasury, which was sort of set up by Congress, but it's under it's not a treasury, it's, it's not an independent agency called OFAC, which deals with sanctions and stuff. And that's really um, um, delegated by, by, by Congress, I mean, the basic uh, uh, operation in the president. And the president issues an executive order and um, presidential staff uh, do uh, interpretations that flesh out some of the details. Um, and OFAC simply disregards everything the White House says. Can the president fire the head of OFAC? Nobody in here knows who the head of OFAC is. Can he, can he threaten to fire the Secretary of the Treasury unless the Secretary of the Treasury fires the head of OFAC? You're the experts on this line of succession, and I, I just don't, I don't know what the answer is. Frankly, I'm a lawyer. I should. I've been been in this field for what 30 or 40 years, and I don't know what the answer is. 
I do think you can uh, draw an answer, and it's a very good question. You know, Humphrey's executor, the reason it's, it never decided what is cause. Right. right. right? So it could be maladministration. Of course, Humphreys, <laughs> it was too late because he wasn't around. It's his erstwhile executor who, you think about an executor, here's a good lawyer, who thought there was an asset in Humphreys' salary that was <laughs> lost, and he won the case. Um, that's really collecting for the estate. Beyond, uh, beyond normal duty. I think uh, he was actually a graduate of the Scalia Law School. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> but so anyway, cause is manipulable, and I do think maladministration or refuse, refusal to carry out the yeah. will of the president, which is legitimate, you know, not let s right. decide something in favor of my friend over here. Um, but this, then it should be, and frankly, there's no injunction either. So if a president were simply to fire someone and then you do uh, after the fact, it's not you stay, it's, you stay in office. You know, it's interesting to go back and look at the legislative, look at the, the legislative history and comments around Lloyd LaFollette in 1912. They were vague about what constituted a protection against termination, and it depended on the circumstances, but they left it, they basically left it to a rule of reason you know, by someone saying that they had been uh, fired for an illegitimate reason, and they let an independent agency, in that case the Civil Service Commission, look at it and decide. That's it. It was just a check and balance. Right. It wasn't a legal hearing. Right. It wasn't due process. It was simply a way to protect against the kind of the <laughs> abusive executive saying, I don't like the way you look, or you know, or something, and you know, you're gone. Yeah. And, and I think how much protection depends on the, so, but to Boyden's point, if the head of OFAC is simply not abiding by legitimate presidential changes in policy, the person ought to get fired. I mean, I just can't believe the Supreme Court wouldn't uphold that. Well, so, uh, Philip, since your paper began, uh, by being heckled by Don Elliott. Why don't we give Don the first question? Right. Uh, Don? <laughs> he wasn't heckled. No. <laughs> I, I was asked, shamed. Just, oh. asked, <laughs> just asked some provocative questions. Um, two quick points about Humphrey's executor. Um, first of all, as I understand it, it does not automatically impose a four cause standard. It says that if an officer uh, of the United States has quasi-legislative or quasi-judicial functions that Congress may but need not provide by statute for for-cause removal. Um, but I think the difficulty here is this language that's ill-defined about quasi-legislative, which goes to some of the policy-making questions. I, I could live with quasi-judicial although I'm not really sure that there is a, a problem with uh, political uh, action to uh, uh, discipline uh, ALJs that, that is worth <laughs> creating the kind of system that people have described, but let's just put quasi-judicial on one side. One of the difficulties is almost every person uh, beyond the, the janitors, beyond the employees, exercises quasi-legislative functions in the government today. And that's because of a couple of major changes that have taken place since Humphrey's executor. Humphrey's executor was decided prior to the revolution that took place in the 70s with informal rulemaking, uh, which is a complete change in the nature of the regulatory process. And then with the immobilization of Congress and the development of the Chevron Doctrine, uh, <laughs> which gives interpretations by the bureaucracy great, great authority. And it remains to be seen under the, under the Kaiser case, which did not overrule the Auer Doctrine, it remains to be seen to what extent the interpretations and guidance documents that, that even really mid-level uh, uh, people are allowed to put out in the, is that quasi-legislative? I think this area needs to be Revisited. Somebody mentioned the, the Wiener case. It was unanimous, but it involved uh, a, a claim settlement, so the classic quasi-judicial. I think the, the thing that uh, 
is, is really important here is, is figuring out whether or not people who exercise policy making authority need to be uh, responsible to uh, political uh, uh, figures. Right. Well, if, if I could, yeah, please point. that was really the question I was trying to raise on deciders. Um, and I guess Mascot says, you know, maybe it's not 2,000 AOJs, maybe it's 14,000 people who run rulemaking. Um, there's no question it needs to be it needs to be addressed. So I just want to tell one anecdote about this, which people at this table undoubtedly have heard, and maybe everybody in this room. Uh, but one day, uh, <clears throat> this was a, in a Q and A that Thomas um, granted to the Heritage Foundation a couple of years ago. Uh, that after an argument that that involved uh, our, um, it, it was not the Kaiser case, it was pre-Kaiser, uh, that involved our, um, it, it wasn't on the dock, but it was it was implicated. And at the end of the argument, uh, as they were leaving, Scalia leans over to Thomas and says, you know, Clarence, that our decision, you know, I think that may have been the worst decision in the Supreme Court's history. <laughs> and Thomas says, I feel your pain, Nino, you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, if there are questions, raise your hand, and I'll call on you the microphone. We'll find you. We'll start here with Daniel, and then second in the back row. Uh, hi, Daniel Flores, House Judiciary Committee. I wanted to follow up on, on uh, Paul's comments about flux and introduce some more flux potentially into the executive branch. I wonder if the panelists have some insights based on the experience with flux in the other two branches, Congress and the judicial branch, uh, can shed here. I mean, both branches, other than the executive, tend to make decisions with more potential for permanence, but they both have a tremendous amount of flux in staff who are informing the decision-making process, whether it's clerks in the judicial branch or congressional staff in Congress. So. Um, I mean, Daniel, as, somebody, as, as a staffer in the legislative branch, do you have any observation on this that you want to add? Or? No, 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 I throw okay. it to the panelists. Yeah. Uh, just as a factoid, the Partnership for Public Service, you know, with all its studies, has come out for non-permanent uh, federal civil service, where much more fluidity in and out. It thinks that would be much healthier. So um, this brings up the MSPB, in my view. Um, which is the question, is that necessary or is that dysfunctional? This is removal. The uh, Merit System Protection Board is the one that the ALJs go to if they're sought to be removed, and they're rarely sought to be removed. They have, like, uh, tenure in office, not different from, from uh, federal judges uh, as a practical matter. But um, the MSPB is not functioning. So that means cases are queuing up. These are people who are having entitled to a hearing before they're removed. There are thousands of cases now pending. You can look up the totals. They grow every day. And they haven't appointed the three um, heads of the agency. Um, so we've got people who, uh, most of them are still on the payroll, sitting around in some office in, a, in Arlington, probably, uh, uh, waiting for their hearing. And, or maybe go home and wait for their hearing. But the MSPB is dysfunctional. We need to fix it. The Partnership for Public Service came up with a plan to do mediation. I, I don't see that as a pro really a problem. It would be a very big problem for public sector unions. I appreciate that. Um, and they would be very, but if you thought about it, you need some hearing, some, some way to do it, like you've been saying, but you don't necessarily need an administrative judge and then an appeal to an administrative agency before you are removed. If that's the question. All right. Uh, the next question's in the back. Do you have a microphone? It'll find you. Uh, my question is about the practical mechanics of civil service reform. So I, mean, I spent five years as a senior leader in the federal government. And in my experience, I was surrounded by high level GS folks who were either under standards that were so old that they didn't actually pertain to the job that they were doing now, or they were detailed to some temporary position that wasn't what they were described to do, or were so vague that you couldn't actually prove that they weren't following them. And that was often a function of the senior leaders just not having the ability to dynamically 
uh, quickly update their standards as the world changed and now people right. needed to have different jobs and make those standards in concrete terms because if you tried to put them in concrete terms and then you put those standards out for approval, somebody would say, but that math says you don't have enough people and you're not allowed to transparently prove that you don't have enough people. Right. You can't say that. Right. And so you, know, you can't have accountability unless the people who are supervising have the ability to quickly, dynamically, and objectively set standards. And so I'm guessing, how does civil service reform enable that so that the tool of removal is meaningful? I, that's a really important question. We've been focused on, on termination and the, you know, having the, the, at least the overhang of you have to do your job or you get terminated. But it, it, one of the insidious aspects of the way uh, civil service has been organized and the way collective bargaining agreements have been negotiated is that they actually preclude management in any meaningful sense. People can't change job descriptions, they can't give them new, the stuff you would do in the private sector to adapt to new problems. The managers don't, they, they have to get effectively, my understanding is that the way good agencies work is they ignore the rules and they develop a culture of, they, they develop a culture within the agency where they simply ignore the rules and they manage it like a regular place, notwithstanding the fact that everything they're doing is contrary to the rule. <laughs> and so, right, 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 and so uh, again, if you provide a mechanism of accountability where someone abuses that flexibility, one way or another, you could say, okay, we're not gonna have all those categories and rules and approvals and you know, all that kind of stuff. But I think it all starts with accountability. The more accountability, the greater the responsibility you can give people. Paul or Boyden, do you have any closing thoughts? Just on the question of accountability, and uh, I mean, just think broadly. Uh, the idea that ALJs are, um, been, the decision to hire an ALJ has been sent to the agencies through executive order, as I mentioned at the outset. Suppose you expanded that and sent to the agencies the decision to hire other people. Um, the, right. the irony is right now, the accepted, there are two million people in government, federal government. The civil service covers about half of them. The remainder are in the accepted service because many agencies have succeeded in getting their own rules. So the irony is there is no civil service system as such. What you really wanted to do, if you have the, per and you've got a model, you pick the best of the accepted <coughs> service. GAO, not surprisingly, is an accepted service agency who worries about performance of agencies, right? Why don't we take their rules? Because they can hire and fire in much more systematic ways. Take the accepted service and maybe merge it into the civil service. That, that's a big that's a good idea. And maybe on a similar vein, it would be good to pick an agency to use as a pilot project for, for some of these reforms. Uh, Boyden, do you have any thoughts <coughs> in closing? Well, my experience in dealing with agencies 12 years in the government and the, um, and of course private practice, is that I agree with Phil Howard that money is not the, it's not really the lure, it's, it's, it's wanting to have a useful, exciting, challenging life and whatnot and challenging job. And my experience has been that for most of the controversial issues that come up that you have to deal with that are difficult, the, the, the agency bureaucrats who are involved are unfortunately extremely capable and extremely energized and extremely motivated and very bright. And so the problem is not the quality, right. or the problem may be the, the quality. quality. <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna break a few minutes early for reasons I'll explain in a moment, but first please join me in thanking our speakers.